Hello everybody. Um, today I am very thrilled to have with me Mr. Vinny Dawson, the Global Head of People Developments at Export Trading Group. Mr. Dawson brings over 20 years of experience across diverse industries, including real estate, mortgage and agriculture. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, taking the time to join us today. Welcome to XLRI. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure, sir. So let's start with something personal. The first thing is like um, I was reading up on your LinkedIn profile and it told a very beautiful story about your love for tattooing and uh, music and you wanted to make a career there. And your initial um, work, I mean, the, you seeked out the work uh, that you went for, for just sustaining that so that you can work on your passions. But then you told that you had found your spark there. And mm -hmm. now you have grown in 20 years, you have grown so much and become such an important leader. The question I want to ask you is, what initially drew you to this field and what continues to ignite that same passion even today? Okay, that's a, that's a really good question, especially because uh, I think I've been in your shoes and I don't know whether I've ever taken off those shoes of being a student. I, uh, that's one of the reasons why I still like coming to campuses. Uh, so when I was around 18, uh, I think I was quite naive. Uh, what I see with uh, a lot of you in business schools mm -hmm. is you have clarity, you, you, you want to get into marketing or you want to get into uh, investment banking or a good consulting firm. Uh, whereas in my case, uh, at that moment in my life, around 18, I was um, uh, naive because I was interested in music, I was interested in tattooing and art in general. Um, but it's not like I was exceptionally good at it. Mm -hmm. I, I loved it. Uh, I used to attend a lot of concerts. I, I was learning to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was also drawing tattoos, you know, the temporary tattoos in college fests and things mm -hmm. like that. So I thought maybe this is what I should be doing because it seems so much fun mm -hmm. uh, and my criteria for a job back then was something that that I should be happy about always. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, I think Destiny had different plans because mm -hmm. uh, I thought okay because all of these things require certain funds mm -hmm. and of course imagine talking to an Indian parent saying I'm going to become <laughs> a tattoo artist. Uh, you know, that's not going to fly very well. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, I found out how much everything is going to cost. And I, uh, during my summer vacation back then, I decided to work temporarily in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my first organization. So, I decided to stay there and I thought, okay, I'll buy everything that I need. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, uh, when you're in school and college, you, you want to buy certain things. I wanted to buy a phone. I wanted to buy, uh, you know, different things back into uh, 2004. So, um, I joined there and then I realized I was getting good money that mm -hmm. even people with, uh, without a, uh, with a graduation were not able to get at that point in time, a premier MBA, whatever, maybe they were not able to get uh, that kind of salary. So, I thought, okay, let me stay around for some time. Um, I stayed there, the money was good, I was still able to go to college, mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to balance both of it. And um, after a while, when I actually got the money, mm -hmm. I did not find the interest to go back into mm -hmm. music and tattooing. And uh, I think uh, I, I was very fortunate mm -hmm. um, back then that few leaders in the organization saw potential in me uh, to be in the learning space and they absorbed me under their wings. Uh, they also created like a baby pool, you mm -hmm. know, like uh, when you have a kid and you, you want to throw them into the swimming pool, but you first put them in the baby pool where they can learn to swim and then they can go into the far end, far, far end of the swimming pool. So in my case, I was fortunate to have leaders who invested in me that way, mm -hmm. who were tolerant towards mistakes, who created a safety net and gave me frameworks rather than micromanage. So mm -hmm. it's not like they spoon fed everything. Mm -hmm. They made sure that we made mistakes as well and learned from it. Uh, and created an ecosystem for growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that foundation helped me to grow. Mm -hmm. But to add a last point to what you asked, what made you transition and you know the purpose, passion and all of that. Uh, uh, my grandmother has been in teaching. Uh, my mother, father, uh, both of them, my parents have been in some form of teaching. Mm -hmm. My sister is a professor in the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, in a way, I felt it's my life's true calling because it mm -hmm. comes naturally to me. But of course, I was afraid initially because why would people want to listen to you is, is a you know, doubt 
or uh, that imposter syndrome that everyone has. Yeah. So I decided that I will take that plunge because I also had this support from people. Um, and I felt it was destiny calling me towards my true purpose in life, my mm -hmm. raison d'etre, if you want to call it. Um, and I've not looked back because it's extremely fulfilling to know that uh, uh, your role is instrumental in building people. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, even now when I, uh, I met somebody here who recalled memories of the past, um, one of my former colleagues works here right now. Mm. Uh, so it, it, it's very fulfilling to know that you're able to create impact mm. in the lives of people. That's such a wonderful answer. Actually, you also mentioned that uh, somebody uh, saw that potential in you. And you had also mentioned in your LinkedIn that you like to see the spark in people rather than to see what they are now. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are not able to see their own potential. Mm -hmm. But as your responsibility itself, uh, you, it is um, imperative that you find the potential in people that they themselves do not know. Yes. Um, so I think the analogy that I used is, uh, you know, the statue of David. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it it is uh, it's significant in the art world, mm -hmm. uh, and apparently the story is several sculptors worked mm -hmm. on that piece of marble, and they said the quality of this marble is really bad. Mm -hmm. We can't work on it. And after a long time, Michelangelo was given that project. Mm -hmm. So if you see a good sculptor will not work on a random piece of granite. Mm -hmm. He needs to already visualize what mm -hmm. is inside. Correct. Uh, and it is a work of art. Like every sinew, every you know, like muscle, everything is almost anatom anatomically correct. So he was he able to see potential in that block of mm -hmm. uh, marble, which a lot of people didn't see. And they said, you know, this is mm -hmm. uh, of no use. Mm -hmm. So he finally made that statue of David, which is today uh, a great tourist atten uh, attraction. And a lot of people go there to see. Uh, and I like to look at people and scenarios that way. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of potential that uh, others are not able to see, or they are not able to project mm -hmm. very well. But you will always notice that a good uh, artist or a sculptor, uh, as in this example, they have certain frameworks in their mind, mm -hmm. indicators of success. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, uh, somebody could show great learning agility mm -hmm. or they could be anti-fragile, which, mm -hmm. which is like you have experienced difficulty in your life mm -hmm. and you almost always leverage that difficulty to become better. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there could be indicators in this individual mm -hmm. which shows that there is potential in mm -hmm. investing in them. But uh, oftentimes what you notice is people go by uh, the black and white, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. where have you worked? What are the projects you've worked? Which university do you come from? But you also carry so many life experiences, which would make you valuable and, mm -hmm. you, you, uh, and you could have skills that make you rapidly pick up mm -hmm. work, uh, yes. right? So, uh, and to, uh, to become a great leader in the future. Mm -hmm. So I feel we need to be on the lookout for those indicators of success. Mm -hmm. And there are many of those indicators of success. Uh, I just gave you an ex a couple of examples of learning agility, anti-fragility, or uh, some people call it resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many other aspects which indicates that this person has potential. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, now, um, let's come back a little bit more technical. Um, when evaluating prospective candidates, Technical competencies are often clear cut, like as you mentioned right now. Mm -hmm. However, how do you assess whether a candidate will be a good cultural fit for the organization? What intangible qualities do you look out for? This is an echo to the answer that you've already had about the street smartness that people generate generally. Yes, of course. Um, uh, so this is a tricky question because uh, I think it's also uh, something related to every organization. Uh, while a lot of organizations look for culture fit, uh, I also see organizations not looking for culture fit. Mm. Um, and if you see um, why people look for culture fit, it's because they want to bring in people uh, who can fit into the existing ecosystem, existing ethos, existing value system, mm -hmm. uh, existing everything, you know, the work style and all of that. Uh, but that could also bring in a lot of biases uh, mm -hmm. within the organization. If everybody thinks alike, if everybody follows the same thing, who is going to question? Uh, uh, and if you, if you, I don't know if you had the opportunity to uh, take a look at the NASA case study of the Challenger uh, uh, rocket that went, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that killed almost everybody. No, it killed everybody in the, uh, in the spaceship. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you see what went wrong, it was the fact that while there were people saying that there is something that is not going to work, uh, 
the leaders in charge still decided to go ahead and launch the space uh, spacecraft. So uh, what happens in bringing everybody who thinks alike uh -huh. and not bringing mavericks or not bringing people who are a little different from you, uh, it's possible that everybody would become a yes sir, yes sir, three bags full kind of a person. Um, however, it's an organizational preference. I think there are organizations which have a lot of structure and they put in a lot of efforts into building their organization and they might see uh, culture fit as an important thing because mm -hmm. the, uh, someone else could disrupt that effort that they've put in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's an organizational choice. Uh, I do have my personal choice, uh, but I wouldn't want to take, judge or take a stand on either. My personal choice is I would like a blend of both. I like a bit of difference. Uh, I, I, uh, because uh, as I said, they bring in such diverse perspective mm -hmm. Uh, that they could challenge you on your traditional thoughts or your biases and things like that. So I do like uh, having a blend of uh, somebody who's potentially not a culture fit as well. Mm -hmm. And I say this because I was not a culture fit <laughs> uh, when I was. Uh, so if somebody said, um, you know, you, um, you're not a culture fit because everybody comes from this background, everybody. I was never a culture fit in anything. That's uh, a compliment, actually. <laughs> no, it, so so if you're never fit in anything, then how would you, um, you know, how, how would you still contribute, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so I've thought of myself as a, as a misfit as well, mm -hmm. and I see that uh, there are others mm -hmm. also who could be misfits who could be of great value addition. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, okay, now coming to uh, considering the current trends in the global job market. Do you observe a shift in preference between campus hiring and experienced market hires? Uh, interesting question because especially this is being asked in a in a campus. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm not sure if it's curiosity or apprehension that's leading to this uh, question. We want b brutal honesty. <laughs> brutal honesty. Yeah. Um, so if you go by reports uh, you know, that are published by BCG, Deloitte all the top guys, there is uh, an indication that the preference towards campus hi hiring is declining. Mm -hmm. Is it significantly declining? I, I wouldn't know mm -hmm. uh, because you guys are actively also, you are able to close your placements by uh -huh. the end of yes, the year, yes. right? So which means you're still not affected. Mm -hmm. Maybe the iceberg is melting, but not melting fast <laughs> enough, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but is there a, a tremor in this space? There is definitely a tremor because uh, uh, if you can see the paper ceiling, as they call it, the mm -hmm. the value for degrees and mm -hmm. all of that is little by little being toned down. Earlier, it was the diversity, the glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and there was a time when education was only for the elite. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or people who had the money mm -hmm. or people who had great de determination. If you have, uh, you know, you, if you're a great, uh, if you had great academic rigor, plus you, you were okay to take the risk of uh, either get, getting a scholarship which is also possibly difficult and uh, and or uh, taking a uh, education loan mm -hmm. right so it was not that path was not for everybody but now if you see uh, people over the years have acquired skills that and uh, an institute like yours or many others mm -hmm. could provide mm -hmm. and they are, they are having uh, they, they are they have the opportunity of getting a practical experience of all of that, mm -hmm. whereas uh, a lot of institutes still focus on the theoretical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were put in the shoes of a CEO mm -hmm. uh, or a business leader who had two choices, mm -hmm. which is, um, should I hire from the campus, mm -hmm. uh, especially a premier business school versus uh, hiring from the market mm -hmm. uh, with a particular set of skills, like mm -hmm. they have proven track record of solving a particular type of business problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have both these dilemmas. So mm -hmm. you would be in the crossroads because on one side, there is advantage in hiring young talent from the colleges because you bring fresh perspectives, uh, one. Uh, two, the culture fit and all of that that you spoke about, it's easy to, because you guys are malleable. Mm -hmm. uh, like gold, you could be, you know, like mm -hmm. bent into different shapes and all of that. It's possible to, uh, invest in young talent and get them to be future leaders of the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas somebody with experience, mm -hmm. and yesterday uh, at the dinner table, few of us were talking about this. Um, one of the CHROs was talking about uh, people who typically say, 
my previous company was better mm-hmm. my previous company had these benefits so they always have a reference point to compare mm-hmm. and uh, there is a g- general reluctance to adapt mm-hmm. i'm not saying always because there are all types of people right there are billions of people in the workforce so you can't generalize uh, so there are advantages in hiring campus uh, mm-hmm. talent as well as uh, talent uh, from straight out of the market i feel it is based on a business need Mm-hmm. Uh, and the business need could vary if it is uh, a quick ramp up and we need somebody who can hit the ground running who has a track record of success then maybe um, uh, a direct hire from the market is a better idea but let's say we are building a leadership pipeline mm-hmm. uh, and we want to invest in uh, building the ethos building institutional knowledge into this young talent uh, and then uh, watching them grow within the organization giving them a career then uh, and also some people do it altruistically because mm-hmm. they want to Uh, you know giving somebody a career is a is such a fulfilling thing Definitely. so uh, i also see leaders who have have that altruistic side mm-hmm. so th- for those reasons they might uh, still hire uh, campus uh, recruits A- and i see value in both so mm-hmm. it's not like one is better than the other uh, i would say it's fit to purpose so mm-hmm. there are places where campus uh, hires fit in better mm-hmm. especially where you have room to nurture them and uh, help them evolve in a particular space and there are places where um lateral or direct hires from the market could be a better idea yeah that's a very one uh, that's a very right perspective i think based on the need so but in the perspective of a cost effectiveness like um, uh, let's say you have an option to either hire from this and you are very co- budget conscious uh, which one would you go for which one would offer a higher return on investment for the i mean of course it's associated with the cost so which one would you go for if you are, have a lot of budget constraints in your recruitment see again uh, it, it's a scenario based uh, mm-hmm. let me g- give you a scenario pro campus okay pro campus scenario is we invest in young talent mm-hmm. uh, groom them to be in the leadership pipeline mm-hmm. they get a lot of business exposure a few years down the line you're creating succession for a particular role you're creating a talent which is enterprising mm-hmm. young bringing in a lot of energy mm-hmm. and they're growing and you uh, if you crudely take the aspect of cost to company mm-hmm. the cost to company of the homegrown talent might be lesser than the cost to company of hiring somebody at a lateral level at a senior level at a later stage but i wouldn't do that comparison you will see that the larger value that the campus hire would bring in here is uh, you're growing with the company mm-hmm. you you're also you also have this academic rigor mm-hmm. so you're blending um what is available so it's blending street smart and book smart let's mm-hmm. put it that way ah, okay. so the outcome could be substantially better for the organization mm-hmm. uh, and you uh, more than anything you bring in that rigor the energy uh, mm-hmm. into the organization so uh, i would say that would be one of the greatest uh, advantages uh, of uh, having young talent come in besides that you uh, things like reverse mentoring uh maybe there is a legacy leadership team in that particular organization mm-hmm. uh, whereas you're coming in uh, with such fresh perspective mm-hmm. of um, problems of today's worlds and you're anticipating certain challenges in the future so you could also reverse mentor the leaders in the organization whereas mm-hmm. if they hire more people similar to them mm-hmm. then uh, everybody is again thinking the same mm-hmm. uh, so I, i do see quite a lot of benefits in campus uh, hiring um market hiring we've already spoken there yeah, are yeah, yeah. it has its own advantages well. definitely thanks a lot for for putting your new perspective uh, the next uh, we'll go to the next question with the rapid advancements in technology upskilling employees has become more crucial than ever how do you ensure that your workforce remains competitive in such a dynamic environment uh that's indeed true so um, as an example our learning partner uh, also shares with us industry statistics month on month mm-hmm. because if you see um we live in a world of disruption right everything is changing so quickly uh, there are mega trends that are coming in uh, it's not like a, a flavor of the week it's like a mega trend you don't mm-hmm. know uh, uh, what's going to disrupt the industry mm-hmm. so uh, we actively keep an eye out for skills mm-hmm. uh, skills in particular uh so we look at well, what are the trend, uh, skills that are trending this year mm-hmm. what are the skills that we currently have in the organization what are the skills that are needed for the future what is the gap here 
and then we actively try and bring it into various programs within the organizations we we have a learning academy uh, called the etg uh, academy mm -hmm. and as part of the etg academy we have uh, four pillars the leadership pillar you have the skills pillar you have uh, a pillar for mastery which is all your technical stuff mm -hmm. it could be it finance trade and things like that and the last one is culture uh, and governance and things like that so the skills pillar is quite important for us um, uh, so we try and infuse different learning interventions across various levels of the organization to cater to those uh, skill adoption and in some cases it's immersive in some cases it is self paced learning uh, through some of these digital platforms we also conduct webinars and things like that uh, are we winning that actively uh, i think everybody is facing the same challenge because uh, acquiring those skills also takes time and there are mm -hmm. so many skills uh, so we are in the curve where uh, at least i feel we we are able to anticipate what skills uh, we need to focus on as an example uh, you know like every company is currently focusing on ai mm -hmm. but if you see because ai is so active there are also parallel skills that are emerging mm -hmm. which is change management as an example maybe ai is going to take away certain jobs or enhance certain jobs mm -hmm. which means that uh, the people who are managing it as well right now will have to be change managed mm -hmm. or there are uh, everywhere there are mergers and demergers and acquisitions and all of that so people are going through so many changes organizations are going through so many changes uh, and you can see that everywhere every day you open a business newspaper uh, or a magazine you see that some massive business changes happen mm -hmm. and imagine the amount of uh, turmoil this puts on employees mm -hmm. leadership team so change management also becomes important how do you make sure that this transition is smoother okay. so we decided that change management is one of our top priorities and then we started infusing it in all the different levels of uh, leadership programs that we have uh, within the organization and as a next step we might even want to infuse it into different projects mm -hmm. uh, so that it becomes an active practice mm -hmm. uh, so it is important we are working on it uh, like most companies i think we are also learning as we go mm -hmm. uh, because these are new challenges uh, i wouldn't say new challenges but not at the pace that it used to be before Mm -hmm. the skills have always evolved uh and a classic example i remember someone spoke about apparently chimney cleaners used to be a job mm. uh in the us many years ago uh so they would go walk around and they would get paid fairly well as well because cleaning a chimney is not easy you know yeah. you have to climb into it it has its risks but today the job doesn't exist i remember during my summer vacations we were asked to learn how to type Mm -hmm. uh, so that you have a job opportunity to at least be <laughs> typist <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that job doesn't exist now so mm -hmm. a lot of jobs that exist today will not exist tomorrow uh, so how do you help people through that transition mm -hmm. all of that is also important right mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 speed at which this is happening is unprecedented i guess mm -hmm. because from a typewriter there was still a transition phase people mm -hmm. could transition quite quickly mm -hmm. but now things are moving very quickly very quickly and following up on the question uh, i mean on the answer that you have given you mentioned that like new technologies like right now generative ai is a buzzword mm. so there has to be somebody in any industry that adopts it right like mm -hmm. let's say there's an industry and there are different people who are ad adopting it in different way ways mm -hmm. now let's say one of your competitors had adopted a particular uh, thing then um that has to be i mean they are going to that's going to be a, be a differentiating factor for them if they work on it and uh, the other other people do not so mm -hmm. is there a team dedicated team that does a research on that like what are the new technologies that come in and what would be relevant for us uh, um within every organization so we are a group of companies mm -hmm. so some uh, a lot of these decisions could also be decentralized mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what do they do but we also have uh, a strong it leader Uh, who also um, influences the leadership team mm. towards some of these uh, i wouldn't just call them trends as i would call them business necessities mm -hmm. uh, because you're hedging yourself for the future right so yeah. we do have teams that do it both centrally and decentrally mm -hmm. okay okay um so let's go on to the next question you've had experience in both mortgage real estate sector as well as in uh, right now in agriculture based sector um how do you, how do the nuances of talent management and training differ from these industries and what key lessons have you brought from one to the other 
Yeah, uh, I think I've been fortunate uh, and I, I, I get asked this question quite a bit. Uh, but I think I've been fortunate to be in a field which is industry agnostic largely. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our foundations were quite simple. Mm -hmm. Adult learning philosophy, how do you find ROI, um, uh, how do you make sure that learning sticks, uh, how do you build leaders for the future. Uh, and all of these have frameworks that can, uh, frameworks and systems that can apply to any type of industry. Mm -hmm. So luckily I've been fortunate to uh, build on those transferable skills that existed mm -hmm. and apply it uh, almost like a cookie cutter template. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes modif modification is definitely necessary depending on industry. Mm -hmm. As an example, in the banking sector, it was heavily compliance uh, focused. Mm -hmm. uh, so of course I had to like alter it a little di differently, slightly differently over there. But um, largely the, the template is going to remain the same. Uh, if you notice in today's panel when certain discussions came up about mentoring or mm -hmm. uh, development of um, these young talent, you mm -hmm. notice that the responses were quite similar to mm -hmm. all the companies that uh, yeah, yeah. The, the consulting firm said, the big four said the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, the aviation giant said the same thing. Uh, so you'll notice that irrespective of whichever industry, everybody has a focus on talent development mm -hmm. um, within them. And that most often is industry agnostic. Of course, it gives you an advantage if you have industry experience because mm -hmm. it gives you uh, leverage to communicate with the business leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, uh, it was because of one of my early mentors mm -hmm. who helped me focus on the ROI part. So, mm -hmm. as an example, in learning, we call it the Kirkpatrick model. Mm -hmm. So, he's uh, most often you will notice that the learning team will focus mm -hmm. on getting good feedback from the participants. Mm -hmm. So, you, you if you get a, a five star rating or a seven star rating or the highest score, then you are happy. But he said, look at it the other way around, uh, which is start with the oh, ROI exactly. or business results in mind, mm -hmm. and then work your way backwards because. If you decide to create a program which makes people happy, mm -hmm. it might not translate into business results. Uh -huh. So right. uh, this approach also helped me focus on what are the business needs in the organization mm -hmm. and then reverse engineer how would we create that particular outcome and not just uh, happiness because mm -hmm. happiness could be a byproduct of uh, people doing great work mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah, but yeah. it is delayed gratification here. Mm -hmm. uh, instant gratification lasts for only a few moments because they might walk out of a session quite happy, mm -hmm. but after a while they may not have um, an application for what they learned. An application for what mm -hmm. they learned. Super, definitely. And um, now coming to uh, uh, a general organization perspective, can you share some of the initiatives you have implemented to help employees upskill and advance within the organization and how do you measure their effectiveness? Yeah, the, this perhaps goes back to the previous mm -hmm. uh, answer. Uh, uh, I, w I don't know if we are doing something um, different from any of the other organizations because every good organization has talent development uh, programs. Uh, we have a lot of amazing talent development programs as well. And we've tried to interweave all of them through mentoring and things like that. So let's say the senior most batch will have to uh, you know, mentor the one level below, the other one, one level below, and maybe a few people can reverse mentor their seniors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have something that uh, that's quite similar to a lot of other organizations. The difference could be perhaps um, is as an example with the campus uh, learning programs or the development programs for the campus to corporate programs. We make it extremely immersive mm -hmm. uh, where they get to shadow very senior thought leaders or mm -hmm. business leaders in our uh, ecosystem. And then uh, they also get live business exposure. So it's not like mm -hmm. they have to look at a presentation. They go to those locations. They mm -hmm. roll up their sleeves and they actually see it happen. And sometimes they do those work, mm -hmm. which they, makes them stronger uh, talent for us in the future. And in our leadership programs, we try to mix a lot, lot of different methodologies. As an example, this year, uh, I'm sure you guys have a lot of case-based discussions, yeah, but we also invited one of the global uh, universities to 
do a case discussion with VR. So it, it makes the case immersive. So imagine mm -hmm. uh, I heard that uh, you had a few case studies about uh, maybe I shouldn't name the company. So uh, you, uh, you must have had a lot of interesting case discussions. But picture uh, having an immersive experience mm -hmm. of putting on the VR glasses and seeing that live, mm -hmm. you know, those experiences live, and then you get into a discussion. So you, uh, you're engaging several senses, it becomes much more immersive and it sticks longer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we try and bring in a lot of different modalities uh, mm -hmm. uh, and projects and action-based projects and things like that, which makes learning stick and at the same time impactful for business. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now looking ahead, how do you envision the HR function changing over the next decade? What key trends should organizations be preparing for now? Uh, I, I am someone who actively follows all the industry reports by everybody, by Deloitte, PwC, mm -hmm. Gallup, Burson, all of that. I, I And I know I'm hearing a lot of human-centric uh, HR in the future. Um, but I, uh, I don't want to take a stand here. And I, I want to, you know, sometimes when you're in the dark, mm -hmm. the best thing to do is take one step at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're worried about all the wilderness and all the darkness that you have to pass through, which is what a lot of people are facing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we are afraid that AI will take over jobs. We are afraid that uh, company cultures are changing or hiring formats are changing. ATS is now doing it. Systems are hiring you. So you don't know how to you know, make it through to the recruiter or the hiring manager. There are a lot of fears and mm -hmm. uh, confusion, right? So I would say even in the HR space, uh, while there are trends that are talking about certain things, uh, I'm going to use the analogy of in the darkness, you take one step at a time, time rather than, you know, like foreseeing what's at the end of the forest. Uh, so if I were to take one step at a time, I see immediate need is uh, development of managers. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you see over the last several years, I don't think everybody got promoted for because they, they were exceptional managers. Mm -hmm. They got promoted because they were also good at performance. Mm -hmm. And people management is an extremely difficult uh, difficult thing to do and it's not for everybody mm -hmm. so you'll see that the middle layer and McKinsey uh, wrote books about it they've been um, publishing a lot of reports about it as well and many others too they're all focusing on the middle layer of the organization mm -hmm. because they are the ones who are ideally supposed to nurture the one below as well mm -hmm. and take care of the people you know like execute the instructions from the top mm -hmm. so they they have a huge responsibility and that's currently sort of like a bottleneck so mm -hmm. I feel the development of the middle layer uh, is extremely important in a lot of organizations. And I'm say saying this generally, mm -hmm. not for a particular organization or my, my organization. I would say change management is definitely crucial also in HR uh, because HR is going to be instrumental in all these mergers, uh, acquisitions, uh, org restructure, all of these things which could put massive pressure on employees mm -hmm. uh, and also in the leadership teams. And if there is effective change management, mm -hmm. that transition could be much smoother, mm -hmm. uh, much, much smoother and possibly more successful as well. Mm -hmm. So I would say change management is another one. Being more tech savvy is definitely something that needs to be looked at because I can still see quite a, a lot of people are tech averse and they're mm -hmm. brushing this off as, you know, this is a buzz phrase and all of that. But <laughs> I feel it's a mega trend and it is going to uh, be okay. very evident. It's already evident. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have our blinkers on and we are not seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it is coming and it uh, it's better that we, are, we prepare ourselves for all those uh, trends related to AI and all, all these different new technologies that, that could impact HR. And, and I don't look at it as uh, something that will take away our jobs. I feel it gives you rocket boosters. Mm -hmm. It gives you like, you know, if you watch Transformers or Power Rangers and all that, it's like those add-ons. Mm -hmm. It makes you significantly more powerful. Uh, it makes your decision making much better. It, uh, in a way, can also root out uh, decision, uh, decision fatigue or biases mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so I do feel that if you reorient yourself or reframe yourself uh, to look at technology as a friend, as an ally, uh, as something that would enhance you, it will be your superpower. But if you look at it 
uh, from the other lens mm -hmm. and keep avoiding it, it would be your kryptonite because mm. uh, it uh, it can definitely like uh, like the Titanic uh, story. It would be the iceberg that would sink the mm. ship. Yes, yes. Thank you for the wonderful answer. Actually, we have come to the end of the session. Um, thank you, sir, for your valuable insights with us today. I've learned uh, personally. I've learned so much from our discussion, and uh, I'm sure our audience here as well. Once again, thank you for agreeing to be part of this podcast. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much.